It's nice to know one of, the, one of the nicest things about doing a series is that you all know where I'm going to start. <laughs> Ephesians 6, and we are finishing verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So today we're going to look at this last piece of the armour of God. But we're not finished with this series yet. There's still another bit to go. But we want to concentrate first of all on the sword of the Spirit. Paul helpfully tells us a little about the sword in this actual verse. For he says, which is the Word of God. What does that mean to us? For many... They immediately say, well, it's the Bible. It's the written word. It's all that has been recorded here. And that is true. But if you look at Bibles today, you will notice that they all are slightly different. Usually because of the way they've been interpreted. Or rather, to be more exact, uh, Rewrit rewritten into our modern language, shall we say, transcribed. I, for example, have a number of different Bibles and a few different Bible apps, and I have preferences, and I have others that I have to turn to simply because it's more or less standard practice, the King James being one example. This here, of course, is the new King James that I'm looking at today, and which I quoted from. But if you were coming from the historic background, you would have been coming from the original text. Now, the original text for the New Testament, of course, is Greek. But for the Old Testament, it's a combination of three different languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and what's that last one? Sometimes Greek, yes, most of it does actually come in Greek. So, let's work on this principle. Which one is right? Should you be reading it in Aramaic? Should you be reading it in Hebrew? Should you be reading it in Greek? Throughout the Middle Ages, you only had a choice of Latin. That was it. Everyone had their own preferences and what became acceptable but the actual words that are recorded in the book are not what the power of the Holy Spirit is you see this word that we have here can be said in so many ways and the reason for that is the meaning is what's important and as long as we don't lose the meaning we don't lose the context of how it's said. So whether you're thou, be, a, uh, and then, or here we are again, <laughs> it doesn't matter. The language itself doesn't reflect it. In the beginning, God created the word, the world. Sorry, say, missed, slip, slip of the tongue. They just catch it on. But which God? You see, if you were a Jew, that wasn't a simple answer. It's the God that took us out of Egypt. That was the God who created the world. But as we are introduced in the New Testament, we find that that God also is the one who became Jesus Christ. And he became the manifestation of of the word of God. Now there's a difference between the written word of God and the living word of God in the presentation of Jesus Christ. We would say Jesus is the Lucas, the spokesman for God. And while that's a nice way of putting things, it's not a hundred percent accurate. You see, Jesus isn't speaking on behalf of God. Jesus is speaking as God. 
And what he says can't be overturned. Do you know the way that in ancient history you would have had a king maybe from Persia or somewhere like that and when they made a writing or a law it was written down and nobody, not even themselves, could turn it around. It was per permanent. So imagine if our laws were like that. Boys, it would be terrible. <laughs> if all our laws were absolutely in stone, cannot be changed. It would be really tricky. I was coming up the road today and I saw a road that has a speed limit on it. It said 40 men an hour. Now the road last week, well two or three weeks ago actually, was 50 men an hour. So imagine if you couldn't have changed that, even for a temporary business. Imagine if it was stuck. And you have people who was going and said, I have to go with 40 men an hour. And other people said, no, you should be going to 50 men an hour. Because it was 50 men an hour before, and they can't change it to 40 men an hour. But there's boys working on the side of the road. They want us to slow down. I don't care. Hit them. <laughs> Run the way. <laughs> you see, you've got all of this concept. And that's what we need to understand when we look at the written word. Because we often look at the Bible and say, well, we can't change anything in it. As it is written in Genesis right through to Revelations, we can't change a word of it. But that's not actually true because God frequently changes words of it. He frequently changes the concepts of things. And one very important thing that he did happened 2,000 years ago. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, who turned the whole thing upside down on its head and said, you see this temple in Jerusalem? You're not going to worship there anymore. Because it's going to be totally done away with. Instead, you're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. Imagine how that sounded to the Jews of the day, especially to the, not just the Sanhedrin, who were the rulers, Pharisees, etc., but to the what were the priests called? Sadducees. The Sadducees. The temple was very important to the Sadducees because, as I say, they were the priests. They worked with that. But they also had a very strict outlook. As far as they were concerned, the only scripture that you could 100% guarantee came from God was that which was wrote by Moses. Five books. Nothing else is considerable. No prophets, no psalms, no writings. Just take them all and put them away over there somewhere because they are not the word of God. They were so confident of this that they once challenged Jesus. It was a lovely wee challenge. They said, there was this man. He married a wife. But he died. It's very sad. But he's seven brothers. You know where the story goes. I don't need to overestimate it. But let's put it this way. There was no children to any of the marriages she had. And so their question was, if, because they don't believe it, if there was a resurrection, how or whose wife is she going to be? Immediately, Jesus responded with a simple question. Or a simple question. Well, statement to them. He said, have you recorded in scripture when Moses was standing at the burning bush and God spoke to him and said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And immediately, of course, they knew, remember, they only accept as perfect the books of Moses and this is the books of Moses so they knew this is right but Jesus had another question God is only the God of the living he's not the God of the dead therefore if his word can't be broken how do you explain that he is their God unless they're going to resurrect now the question and point was very simple but to us it 
sometimes just goes a wee bit over our head because we don't fully understand the background of the thing. But what Jesus had literally done was, he says, look, here's the situation. You say these five books, you have to believe. You don't have a choice. I'm telling you that in these five books, the resurrection of the dead is proved. And they couldn't disprove them. Because it's true. It's true. But how did Jesus do that? Oh, well, it's obvious, isn't it? He's God. He's God in the flesh. That would be easy for him. But we need to sometimes look a little closer. We've got the written word of God. And through Jesus, we have the living word of God. The living word of God manifested as a man. Living among us. Yet Jesus went 30 years before we even get to know him. Oh yes, we do have a wee story of what happened when he was 12. I know that. But I want to leave that to one side for the moment. Basically for 30 years, he's unknown. We have no history of him. There's no magic books wrote, even by a guy called Thomas. There was really not. <laughs> it didn't happen. So here's my question. Why after he was baptized, was he going into the wilderness for 40 days before being tempted? Why? Now, I'm sure everybody has their own reason as to why that had to happen. But have you actually looked at it from a biblical standpoint? Jesus, we are told, is our example. He wasn't proving himself to God. He was doing something that we need to learn. We need to understand. And so when we look at this example, we need to understand what it is. We're about to be introduced to the sword of the Spirit in action but before we do that we need to understand two things the sword may be sharper than any physical two-edged sword it may be designed that it would cut between the bone and the marrow or between the spirit and the soul it may be designed to do that but unless you know how to yield it it's useless now I'm going to tell you something which may surprise you. There is not one individual in this earth, bar Jesus Christ, who has ever used the sword as intended. Every time mankind has used the sword, they have used it as a club. And if you look at the history of Christianity over the world, that becomes very evident. It becomes a club to hit you over the head with and to tell you what's happening. Have you been hit over the head by the Bible from time to time? By what it's supposed to say and why you should do it? Have you? Of course you have. Everybody has. Even from the start of the commandments. Children should listen to their parents. Remember that? Did you all hear that one time or the other? I'm sure you did. Now, did you ask your parents, did you listen to yours? Did they get to ask them, did you listen to yours? Because the command, you see, is being used in a way that's hitting you over the head like a club. Whereas if it was being used effectively, it makes you want to obey your parents. It makes you want to respect your parents. It makes you want to honour your parents. It doesn't make you do it. It makes you want to do it. And that's the slight difference between the spirit wielding the sword and you doing it. <laughs> so this is an important thing. And what we want to look at now through the temptations is why 
Jesus who had never been tempted. Do you know that's written in scripture? Jesus never yielded to temptation. Therefore, he never sinned. He was tempted, but he never yielded. For he was tested in all points. We're told that. But he never yielded to sin. He was 30 years old before he got the Holy Spirit. What about those years? He never sinned. Why? Because he knew how to yield the sword in his life. Do you remember the first recorded miracle according to John? It's the wedding at Cana. Do you know how many Christians hate that particular miracle? Oh, what would he go and do that for? Ruin she. Imagine that. Made the whole place a drunkard. But here's the crack. Here's the bit you have to understand. It was never Jesus' intention to go in and do that miracle. It was his mother's. This is why I brought up the fifth commandment. You see, Jesus knew he didn't have to obey Mary because his time wasn't her dear. He was also a natural at this time. And he understood who he was better than she did. But when she told him, they ran out of wine. And he said, well, what's that going to do with me? My time's not yet. Her response wasn't to argue with him. It wasn't to control him. It wasn't to make him. It wasn't to embarrass him. No. She just went to the servants and said, whatever he tells you, do. And walked on back to her about her residence. That's what she did. She had made it impossible for him not to do something because she had placed the responsibility of the problem squarely with him and told the people, go see to him. See him, he sort of. Sometimes mothers are like that. That's how they work. We call it manipulation. But we're not getting into that. <laughs> Let's bring us back here to a thing. What was Jesus' response? Did he go into a panic? Did he suddenly say, well, uh, no, hang on a minute. Where did he get all that wine? That's what his disciples were thinking. They were thinking, are you going to get wine to feed this lad? I mean, for goodness sake, cost a fortune, never mind anything else. Then Jesus simply says, see them water things that are for ceremonial purpose of washing, etc.? Go fill them all with water. Then take some of the water and take it to the master of the feast. That's it. Where you go. No explanation. No long prayers. No panics. And the servants are going, Are you serious? But they're good at their jobs. And they've been told to listen to whatever he told them. So it's not going to be their faces that are going to have the egg on it. So they went, they filled it up with water, they got a scoop. Look. Here, that was good water you did. It's gone red. I don't know what that's about. Give it to the body. Oh, the best to last. The best to last. Holds him. Groom over, congratulates him, tells him you got it the wrong way right, but I like it. I like it. A lovely wee toast. Best to last. What happened? Well, you see, Jesus knew who he was. Mary knew from him growing up for 30 years in her care what he could do, how he could be approached. And she knew it was a case of Jesus solves problems. She'd seen it all his life. And he always solved them differently from anybody else. He just solved it. And she could never figure this out. How do we know this? Because we know mothers. We know how to think. We know that it's been long the time said, I have to do that. And they also know that when they've got a gifted child, they will use it to promote that child to the best of their ability. And so they'll be putting them in the middle of everything. Everything. 
And that's what Jesus grew up with. He had to have. He had a Jewish mother. And we're told that's a standard, standard characteristic. So when we're meeting Jesus now, age 30, he's just come out of the Jordan River. He's been taken by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the first clue you've got. He didn't choose to do this. He's been guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Or as the Bible puts it, it's imposing its or the Spirit's imposing his will upon Jesus to go into the wilderness. And so there's where you have your first situation. Jesus has been told what to do. So Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days, nothing to eat. We don't know what happened during the 40 days. But we do know that at the end of the 40 days, Satan's permitted to come to him. And how does Satan approach? Very simply. He walks up, locks around, recognises Jesus as hungry, and said, If you're the Son of God, you could just talk to them stones and tell them, become bread. And they would. But, but, but you know, that's if you were the Son of God. Jesus is very hungry. We know that Jesus could deal with this. He could have responded to Satan one way or the other, and it would have been the correct answer. But that wasn't what he was asked to do. He was asked to yield to the Holy Spirit. And yielding to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke through Jesus. The Holy Spirit yielded the sword of the Spirit in Jesus' life and responded with a scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Satan wasn't expecting that. He was expecting to deal with Jesus. And said he was dealing with the Holy Spirit. So we had it back off a minute and think of this again. So he comes back. He says to Jesus, Come with me to the height of the pinnacle of the temple. Jesus followed him. Now think about this. Jesus went with Satan to the pinnacle of the temple. He listened to him. He took his advice. He went with him. Why? Because the Spirit said, let's go. Top of the pinnacle of the temple. Satan says, it is written. God will protect you. You won't even stub your toe. As you walk about. Therefore, if you're the Son of God and you're convinced you're the Son of God, throw yourself off. The angels will come and guard you down carefully. There'll be no problem. You'll not have a problem. Jesus knows all of this is true. But again, he's been asked, yield to the Spirit. So he yields. And the Spirit says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Simple as that. The third temptation, of course, he again invited to go for a wee walk with Satan and the day to a very high mountain. And Satan shows them in vision all the kingdoms of the world and says, These are all mine. I control all of these. Every single one of them, without exception. Jesus didn't argue. He says, look, we both know what you will have to go through, but we don't have to. If you acknowledge me, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of these without any problem whatsoever. I'll put them all in your authority. Jesus again yields to the Spirit. Depart from me, sin. It is written. You shall worship no other but the Lord your God. Three times. Then angels came, ministered to his needs, and fed him. And we have a start of Jesus' ministry. But why I want to bring that across in such a way is because every time you have read that story before, that incident that happened, 
These were taught that it was Jesus who was overcoming Satan. Oranges. But it wasn't. It was the Holy Spirit that was overcoming Satan. We know that Jesus wouldn't have had a problem because he'd been doing it for 30 years before. But now he had to learn to yield to the Spirit. Throughout his ministry, he had to learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had to be there to make the decisions alongside him. They had to be in agreement. And that's something we have to learn. You and I. You see, Jesus told his church. The things I do, you will do. And greater things you're going to do. Because I'm going to the Father. So greater things are expected of you. And when you look over all the things Jesus did. All of those things are meant to be done by you. And immediately you'd go, ah, no way. I couldn't do that. And you're 100% correct. You can't. But every single thing that you're looking at in the New Testament, that you see operated and performed in Jesus' life, every miracle, every healing, every casting out, was done through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he wielded by the Holy Spirit. And guess what you were given as a gift from Jesus? The sword of the Spirit! No. You're still used as a club. You just can't help yourself. You were given the master swordsman, the Holy Spirit himself, to live in you, to work through you and to use that sword effectively in every situation. There's only one requirement from you. One requirement. You've got to work in agreement with the Spirit. You've got to agree with Him. No, I don't mean, no, let me rephrase this. This is going to be tricky. I have to do this delicately. When I was younger, I was talking to God about different things. And I said, look, here's my problem. I want to do it. You know I want to do it. But someone always gets in the way. So why don't you do it through me without me getting involved? I know you'll deal with it. I was driving from Oma to Oma. So from Siskinor to Oma. And there's a bit halfway there. Where it's adjoining the road and it's called the Green Point. And I heard in my head the most loudest shout. I'm not going to say exactly what the shout was, but it caught me off guard. I tell you, it caught me really off guard. But the shout basically works upon the principle of I don't do that. That's not how I work. I am not in that sort of a relationship with you that I would do that. You have got to be in total agreement to every aspect of work that is done in your life. Every aspect. So if you want to put your hands and heal the sick, uh, by the way, you can't do that. You do realise that, don't you? I know, you have all tried. It doesn't work. The Spirit, on the other hand operates through you so that when you put your hands out he heals he heals when you open your mouth to prophesy that don't work for you I mean you really don't know anything other than what you've learned but the spirit knows everything of God past present and future and he can prophesy perfectly You are now, as children of God, the sword in the Spirit's hand. And he can wield you 
and all that happens within your life to the glory of Jesus Christ if you're willing to let him. We started off, we explained that the sword of the Spirit was the Word of God. We showed you the Bible. Then we explained that it became Jesus Christ. But he's in the Father now, sitting at the right hand. And yet, the sword is still here. And you don't wield this one. But the Spirit wields the sword on the earth, which is the church. The body of Christ. You are now this sword. When we started going through this armour, we started off very simply. We said, the belt of truth. Well, you weren't the belt of truth. Have you never told a lie? Ever? Of course you did. We said you were the breastplate of salvation. Have you always been the breastplate of salvation? No. Helmet? Shield? Shoes? No. They're all Christ. They're all Christ. But you get to wear them because the Spirit is dressing you in them. So that you might be the sword. In his hands to yield. And that's why you have to understand this armour. And you need to understand why it's so important in your life. Because it reflects the ongoing life of Jesus Christ in this world. Through you, individually. But if you want to be wielded by the Spirit, you have to yield to the Spirit. That's hard to say, do you think? Try it sometimes. Wield and yield. Whoa, we'll get mixed up. But you do. To be wielded, you have to yield. You have to be willing to yield. Not submissively, but in agreement. Not as one enslaved and without power of your own. Because at any point, you have the right to say, no. Even the apostles understood this. Paul says, when you prophesy, you're in control. The Spirit's doing the prophecy, but you're in control. That doesn't sound right, except it has to be. Because there's times when the Spirit wants to say one thing, but for reasons, God simply, or you simply, determine, no, this might not be the best time to do that. It's a shared responsibility. There's other times when the Spirit has to come back and say, listen, the reason you didn't want to do that is because you were afraid. We, we can't have that. You've got, to have, you've got to stand up here. And other times the Spirit will say, yes, I agree. That would have been inappropriate at that time, but it doesn't mean it was wrong. And you need to understand it. These are, the, these, these, are, these are the responsibility of the Spirit. Now that basically concludes the armour of God. But there's one more piece. Not for you to wear, but on how you actually bring the armour and put it on. And that is prayer. And the reason I have been highlighting the fact that the Spirit has to wield the sword is because it is... Praying with the Spirit. This interaction between you and the Spirit that enables you to work effectively for Christ. But we'll get into that next time. Thank you.